And we stepped a little bit away from conversations with journalists to talk about larger trends. It was climate yesterday. It is conflict that's quite front and center for journalism today. As we speak, the war between Russia and Ukraine has entered its 750th day. It's also an interesting day in terms of what's happening in Russia. Over the weekend, there will be elections held in whatever shape and form we may choose to define them at this point. And from all new sources uh, that we understand and from the situation that one gauges from the ground, it looks like it will be a re-election for Vladimir Putin, who will then be neck and neck with Joseph Stalin in terms of being uh, in power in Russia. Um, it hasn't been easy for those reporting in areas of conflict around Russia and Ukraine. And of course, the problem at this point is that it's not isolated. There are other parts of Europe that are now seeing very, very dangerous conflict, which may have bigger ramifications both for the EU and the citizenry. I am absolutely delighted to invite and have with us today, sharing all his wisdom, Timothy Garten Ash. He's a historian, he's an author, he's a reservoir of knowledge around European history. And of course, he's most recently released his book, that's called Homelands, A Personal History. We are especially delighted because Timothy is also part of the Reuters Institute's steering committee, and it's great to have you here, Timothy. Um, you're going to talk, of course, uh, about the repercussions for citizenry, how they're reading what looks like democratic backsliding, what it means for the kind of world that they want to live in, especially in a critical year like 2024, but let me also sort of open this up by saying uh, to the audience that your book, Homeland, is now available. I'm waiting to get a copy. It tells the story of the emergence of Europe, um, how it started, how it moved towards the idea of a whole Europe and then faltered. And what I found most interesting in that as a little nugget, Timothy, is that you were 17 when Britain joined the European community. Um, you're a little bit older than that when uh, Britain finally chose to step away from it. And what a ride it's been. Mitali, thanks very much. It's great to be here. And back at the Writers Institute, I was actually present at the creation of this institute. And it's done an absolutely amazing job. And you have a fantastic network of alumni. Um, I've, of course, spent my life as both an academic and a journalist. Um, as Conor Cruz O'Brien, who did the same thing, used to say, I have one foot in each grave. <laughs> um, so, so it's great. And journalists really matter, and, and good reporting in particular really matters in the world we're going to talk about. What I'm going to do is, um, in three parts, uh, roughly 10 minutes each, First, to talk a little bit more about this book, available on all good Amazons, just out in paperback, um, because that tells us how we got here. Yes. Secondly, talk about where we are in Ukraine, in the war in Ukraine and the, the choice that Europe faces and what the consequences will be of that. And then I'm going to go to how the world reacts to it, because I think for people on this Cool. It's going to be really interesting. And I'm going to show you some polling we've done with um, my Oxford project did with the European Council on Foreign Relations. So first of all, the book. The book is a very unusual genre. It took me just 50 years to write, uh, 50 years of traveling around Europe, studying Europe. It's a history illustrated by memoir and reportage. So it's full of stories, the kind of stories you get as a journalist. But the stories are all there to illustrate the history. Right. So, for example, I walk through the Berlin Wall the day after the wall has come down across what used to be the death strip at Potsdamer Platz and into East Berlin. And I meet a young East Berliner, very, very excited, who says he'd just seen a handwritten poster that says only today is the war really over. And that's not just an anecdote. Because I would argue that for the whole of Europe behind the Iron Curtain, the whole of Eastern Europe, the war was only over. The Second World War was only over in 1989. And then I go on to um, talk to Margaret Thatcher to try and persuade her that German unification is actually a good idea. She ended up saying, OK, I've got the message. I'll be very nice to the Germans, which I'm not sure she was. 
uh, to Eric Honecker, the former East German leader in prison, Helmut Kohl, uh, then the Chancellor of German Unity, who, who at one point tells me, do I realize I'm sitting opposite the direct successor to Adolf Hitler, which is a bit of a conversation stopper. But all these stories are there to illustrate the history, and the history is of Europe and freedom, the two light motifs of my work. And this, this will connect to the point about the war. So when I started traveling in continental Europe in the early 1970s, Europe was still a continent of dictatorships. We did the math. 389 million Europeans still lived under dictatorships, not just the whole of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, but also Spain, Portugal, Greece, all of them still under fascist dictatorships. Um, only 289 million Europeans lived in democracies. And starting with the end of the South European dictatorships, uh, Greece, Spain, Portugal, you have basically a 35 year ascending curve in the spread of freedom and the spread of the West and the spread of European institutions. So think about it, 1972, just six members of the European community and just 15 of NATO. 2007, 27 and 26, all the way to the Baltic states. So you have this amazing spread of freedom and of Western institutions and of the European Union. And um, of course, it wasn't a continuous upward curve. You had, you know, you had the war in former Yugoslavia, the five wars in former Yugoslavia, you had 9-11. Although interestingly, one of the things I found out working on this book is that 9-11, which we all thought was going to be the great epochal turning point in world history, in European history, it isn't the great turning point in European history, right? It is in American history, it is in Middle Eastern history, but in European history, it's 2008. 2008, simultaneously, within a month or two of each other, the beginning of the global financial crisis and Vladimir Putin's seizure of two great chunks of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the first major act of aggression, start a cascade of crises, what I call the downward turn. So the, the financial crisis segues into the Eurozone crisis, which plagues a lot of Europe for many, many years. Um, 2010 already, Viktor Orban starts demolishing democracy in Hungary. You know, we have a full member state of the Europe European Union that's not a democracy. Um, 2014, Putin sees of Crimea, the beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine, which has now been going on for a decade in eastern Ukraine. The refugee crisis, Brexit, Trump, COVID, all the way down to the 24th of February 2022, and the beginning of the largest war in Europe since 1945. I argue that the 24th of February 2022, the beginning of the full-scale war in Ukraine, ends what I call the post-wall period, the period that begins with the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989, ends on the 24th of February 2022. And it, it, it kind of, it overlaps with the post-war period, i.e. the period Europeans traditionally um, ascribed to the period post-1945. And those two end together on the 24th of February, 2022. So now we're at the beginning of a new period of European history, uh, characterized by a major war on our continent. And here's the point beginnings in history or international relations, as in romance, really matter. The first years, months and years really matter. So if you think about it, in the first few years after 1945, was created the international order that we lived with for the next 40 years, and to some significant degree in the institutions we're still living with to this day, right? UN, World Bank, IMF, on we go. All those major institutions were created then. Just in those few years, Dean Asherson, the US Secretary of State, said, present at the creation. And then the two or three years after 1989 created the European order we've been living with for the last 30 years, 
characterized by this great enlargement of the West, the geopolitical enlargement of the West, i.e. NATO and EU. So that that makes this moment a, a, a particularly important one, right? So what we do now is probably more important than what we do in five or six years' time, right? Just as what Europe did in 1948 is more important than what it did in 58 or in 1991 more important than in 1998. So that's where we are. If you ask why we've got ourselves into such a mess, having apparently done so well for so long, a large part of the answer is our old Greek friend Hubris. We became so overconfident in so many directions. The US in Iraq, cool Britannia, the Eurozone, the EU itself, uh, neoliberal economics. Um, and we made the great mistake of thinking we knew which way history is going. And that's a big mistake because you never know which way history is going. And just as we thought we knew which way it was going, namely our way, 2008, it starts going the other way as it's continuing to do. There's also a, a particular mistake we made. Um, there's a great essay by a guy called Reinhard Koselleck called The Unknown Future and the Art of Prognosis. And he makes a very simple point that the more phenomena recur in history, the more likely you are to be able to make probabilistic statements when they pop up again, right? So revolutions, for example, wars, what happens when people have been in power for too long? It's happened so many times before that when you see it happening again, you can make some probabilistic statements about how it's going to go, usually not well. Now, another such phenomenon is declining empires. Let me tell you something about declining empires. They don't like it. Ask the British. Ask the French. Ask the Portuguese. Actually, that period we call post-war, post-1945, the major West European colonial powers spent decades fighting quite brutal wars to defend their empires. So when the largest remaining empire in Europe, namely the Soviet Russian empire, softly and suddenly vanished away with hardly a shot fired in anger between 1989 and 1991, we shouldn't have assumed it was the end of the story. And so, I mean, don't get me wrong, we were right to try and help Russia to modernize and democratize. But when the empire started striking back, Georgia 2008, big time, Crimea and Ukraine 2014-15, we should have said, aha, we recognize this from history. This is what declining empires do. They try and get their empires back. And uh, I would argue if we'd had a much stronger reaction after 2014, we might not be in the mess we're in. Perhaps we can talk about that in Q&A. But make no mistake, Putin himself says this very clearly. That is his fundamental motivation. To get, for him, Russia has to be a great power, which means an imperial power, or it's nothing. And the former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, as some of you may have seen, who's now a great Putin booster, made a classic statement of this the other day. Behind him, a huge map in which almost all of Ukraine was shown simply as Russia. And he quoted the title of a book by a former Ukrainian president, which was Ukraine is not Russia. And then he said, Ukraine definitely is Russia. Now, this Mitali, as you will know very well, this is the ultimate colonial grammar. It's not X belongs to Y. It's X is Y. So the Brits at the beginning of the 20th century said Ireland is Britain. Ireland is Britain. Uh, Poland is Germany, said the Nazis. Right? Algeria is France, said the French in the 1950s. So make no mistake about it. This is, and that is a fundamental motivation, a war of recolonization. So this brings me to the second part. Where are we in this war after just over two years? 
I will pause for just a second, Timothy, to let our audience know that um, they can keep writing in questions as you move to right. discussing Ukraine. If there are questions, put them in and I'll start storing them in. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted your flow of thought. Not, a, not at all. Keep, keep, keep them coming because there'll be, there'll be more things to ask questions about or make comments about. Where are we now? Don't kid yourself that it's a stalemate or that we're somehow near the end, near to a negotiated settlement. We are in the middle of a long war. It is, if you like, to take the Second World War comparison, 1941, going on 1942. Um, neither side is prepared to give up. Neither side is prepared to negotiate. Both sides still think they can win. And from the Ukrainian point of view, some things have actually gone quite well. Amazingly, they have pretty much driven the Black Sea fleet out of Crimea and out of Sevastopol, which had been a Russian naval base for decades, actually, for, for the, back to the 19th century. Um, so, so, so it's not all gone Russia's way, but, the, but at the moment on the land war, in eastern Ukraine in particular, the Russians are grinding forwards. And there are several reasons for that. I visited wounded Ukrainian soldiers in a rehabilitation clinic in Lviv a few months ago. I've been to Ukraine four times since the beginning of the full-scale war. Guys without a leg, without two legs, without arms, without hands, without feet. Almost all of them victims of the terrible Russian minefields on the southern front in particular. And one of these guys who lost a foot, experienced soldier, I said to him, why is it going so badly? And he said, the Russians have more men. Couldn't be put more simply. But that's partly, of course, because they have a much larger population. It's easier for them to conscript. But it's also because Ukraine has been very hesitant to conscript younger men into its armed forces. That's something we might want to talk about. But the bigger reason is because Russia's got its economy onto a war footing. North Korea has supplied more ammunition than the whole of Europe. Um, Russia has very good ties with China economically. Uh, there's a lot of sanctions evasion. And so their production machine, they have that war economy. And at points on the Eastern Front, they're using 10 times more ammunition uh, than the Ukrainians are. Well, naturally, of course, the Ukrainians and exhausted soldiers, average age 43, um, one-tenth of the ammunition of your opponents, of course you're going to be pushed back for, for all that bravery and for all the use of drones, which have been an amazing innovation in this war. So they're being pushed back. A war of attrition is a war of production. Now, potentially, obviously, the West and even Europe alone can far outproduce and outsupply Russia. The German economy alone is two times the size of that of Russia. EU about eight times, um, the West as a whole about 20 times. So even if the US, I mean, we'll come back to Trump, but even if the US is not supplying anymore, Europe actually has a lot of kit it could supply tomorrow, like the uh, uh, German Taurus missiles with which Ukraine could hit the supply lines through Crimea. But um, we could step up our production. So Europe faces a choice. Do we, as quite a lot of European leaders and quite a lot of European public opinion privately wants, try to get to some sort of quote-unquote peace, it's not really peace, but some sort of frozen conflict along the current lines of division, more or less, or do we actually help Ukraine to win back the larger part of its territory, if not all its territory, above all the territory it's lost since the full-scale invasion in 2022? Just to give you an idea of scale, the territory currently occupied by Russia is the size of the entirety of Portugal and most of Slovenia, right? It's huge. 
and many millions of Ukrainians lived there before the war. I've talked to people. They show you on your Google Maps on your phone. There's my house. There was my school. That's where I worked. And they want to go back. So the point is this. If we, and it, and it is very much our choice as well as theirs, if we compel Ukraine to settle uh, along roughly the current lines of territorial division, um, this will be seen by every single Ukrainian as a massive defeat. It will also be seen by Vladimir Putin as a great victory. He argues in historical terms, he will say, I have got back those territories that Peter the Great and Catherine the Great conquered for Russia in the 18th century. They're called Novorossiya, New Russia. Um, I have ingathered the Russian lands. Russia remains a great power. That means Putin's going to be in power, um, most probably for much longer, because he's got a victory. And what is more, in the eyes of the rest of the world, and I'll come to this in a moment with the polling, this is going to be a great victory for Russia and a great defeat for Europe and the West. So that's what's at stake in the choice that Europe is particularly is making, and the US, of course, but particularly Europe at the moment. And it's not going to be decided this year, but what we do this year in terms of ammunition, arms, money, training for Ukrainian forces is going to decide the outcome in 2025, 2026. That was part two. Where we are with the war, I'll welcome all questions and comments on that. Now we go to, and I'm about to share my screen, how the world reacts to it. So how the world reacted to it has been a terrific shock for us in Europe and the West, however you define the West. Because to us, it seemed self-evident that this was a brutal criminal war of aggression and a war of recolonization. And so we went to, quote unquote, the global South, by the way, a terrible term. And the best thing we could do in talking to the global South is stop talking about the global South. But we went to India, we went to South Africa, we went to Brazil, we went to China, of course and discovered that they didn't see it that way at all. And that this narrative that we were pushing, also the narrative of, of democracy against autocracy, was simply not having any traction. My research project at Oxford did, now something here is happening here, doesn't blood I mention share? Give us a, there we are, share screen. Oh, I see, click on that, very good. There we are, bingo. Okay, can you all see that? Can you see that? Very clearly. Yeah, you can see that. Fantastic. Where do I click through that? And don't I need that? You can use the mouse. Which one there? Yeah. And then uh, just click. Uh, one right? Yeah. This is not my computer, I add. Oh, fantastic. Bingo. Fantastic. So my Oxford did a um, research project, which is called Europe in a Changing World, did two big rounds of global polling with the European Council on Foreign Relations. And we did Europe, and then we did China, India, Turkey, Russia, US, um, uh, South Africa, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Brazil. Right? So a very big chunk of the major non-European powers and non-Western powers, BRICS plus. And I'm just going to quickly show you a few um, findings and then make a couple of comments on them. First thing, this is optimism, pessimism. Look how relatively pessimistic the West is. Europe and the United States way down compared with the enormous sense of optimism in a country like India or Indonesia. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Basically, it shows that if people had to live somewhere else, they would prefer to live in the West, and they actually prefer the Western position on human rights or internet 
regulation. Now we come to the view on Ukraine. As you can see, in most of these countries, with just a couple of exceptions, like South Korea, the majority or plurality view is the conflict between Russia and Ukraine needs to stop as soon as possible, even if it means Ukraine giving control of areas to Russia. Okay, so that was their view, and that was their view both in our polling at the very beginning of last year and autumn last year. Now, here's a stammer for you. Is the United States at war with Russia? We didn't even mention Ukraine. We just said, is the US at war with Russia? Red is yes. So China, that's 57% of Chinese think the US is at war with Russia. They don't think of it as a war between Ukraine and Russia. They think of it as a war between the West and Russia, which is, of course, the Russian narrative. Uh, what's the biggest obstacle to peace between Russia and Ukraine? So in blue, basically, you have the West. So as you can see, there's a diagonal line down there. Uh, we in the West think, obviously, Russia is the big, biggest obstacle. But by the time you get down to Turkey, it's 50-50, roughly. Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, China, the majority think it's the West that is the obstacle to a peace. Who's likely to win? Most of them think Russia is likely to win within the next five years. Um, forget about that one. Yeah. Do you think the EU is likely to fall apart within the next 20 years? Again, remarkably, so Bloom is think it will fall apart. Remarkably large figures, over 50% in China, Saudi Arabia, pluralities in Turkey, India, South Africa, think the EU is likely to fall apart within the next 20 years. And then here's one of the most interesting ones. There's a clear correlation between those who think Russia's going to win and those who think the EU is going to collapse. So that demonstrates incredibly clearly that, the, that the, the credibility of the West and particularly of Europe is at stake. And as for attitudes to Russia, let me just swing that. This is so fascinating. So we're looking at mutual perceptions. Dark blue, an ally, light blue, a necessary partner, or a rival, an adversary. So most of us in the West see India as an ally or necessary partner. But how India sees others? 51% Russia, an ally, 29% a necessary partner. Um, uh, uh, more than for Great Britain, um, only slightly less than for the US and the EU. We're fine with the US, we're fine with the EU, we're fine with Britain, we're fine with Turkey, but we're fine with Russia too. Um, Turkey, similar picture, right? We're fine with the EU, but we're also fine with Russia and the US. And then here's the last one I wanted to share with you, because Joe Biden frames this as a compliment a conflict between autocracy and democracy. So we ask, which of the following countries comes closest to having a real democracy? China, 77%. Now, some of that will be because respondents thought that's what I have to say, that's what the party would like me to say. But nonetheless, it's a stunning figure. 57% say India, critics of Narendra Modi might raise an eyebrow there. Even 36% in Turkey, which is clearly not a democracy at the moment. In other words, um, you can see the full um, the full findings in our reports there. So that that just illustrates, I think, incredibly clearly just how different the perception is in the rest of the world and how ineffective the Western narrative has been. And then we have Israel Hamas. That polling was just before Israel Hamas. I think. The West was just beginning to get a little traction in its criticism of Russia's war in Ukraine on the grounds of violation of international humanitarian law, the killing of civilians, the kidnapping of children. Um, Putin faces an indictment before the International Criminal Court. And then the Israel-Hamas war. And the credibility of the West and particularly also of Europe, U US and Europe, is kind of blown out of the water because everyone says these are absurd double standards. I was talking to a very senior EU figure in, in Brussels the other day and he said, I just can't say anything. And 
South Africa or Brazil or India because of what's going on in in the Israel Hamas war. Now we we interpret this world, and this is my penultimate comment, Mitali, to allow lots of time for for comments and questions. We interpret these findings as being what we call an a la carte world. So no longer bipolar in any of the framings of West and the rest, North and global South, democracy, autocracy, take your pick. But one of multiple powers um, which see themselves, well, first of all, have a shared experience of colonialism. After 600 years of European colonialism and 200 years of Western supremacy and nearly 80 years of US supremacy, it's payback time, right? It's payback time. So there's a strong emotional component, which is enough of you telling us what to do and what to think. Then many of these countries see themselves, and of course I'm painting with a broad brush, as great powers once again, as to great civilizations, as to empires in many cases, the Ottoman Empire, the Chinese empires, Indian empires, and again great powers. And they actually behave very like late 19th century European great powers. So Lord Palmerston famously said, uh, Great Britain has no eternal friends, only eternal interests. And actually, Modi's India, Xi Jinping's China, South Africa, Brazil, they're quite Palmerstonian in many ways. Um, We have our national interests. They say that quite clearly. She says it, Putin says it, Modi says it, Erdogan says it. And we will p- pursue them with whoever we like. And what is more, we don't have to choose between one block and another. Because the other thing our polling showed is that they think they can get away with having a good security relationship with the US in many cases and doing great business with Europe, including um, enjoying European culture and um, close economic ties with China, hence a la carte Europe. Um, And so this Europe more resembles, I would say, late 19th century Europe, right? A Europe of great powers pursuing their national interests um, without paying so much attention to values than it does the late 20th century Europe of the European Union, which in that golden age of the spread of freedom that I was talking about, we fondly imagined was going to be a a model of governance for the rest of the world to follow. But actually, the rest of the world is more like late 19th century Europe than late 20th century Europe. So last sentence before throwing this open, we talked about the post-war period. We talked about the post-war period, 1989 to 2022. What's this next period of European and world history going to be? Question mark. One candidate is another post-W, post-Western world. Of course, nobody knows what exactly, but the way it looks at the moment and the story I've been trying to tell you about the world's reaction to an issue that we in Europe and thought was so simple and so clear, suggests to me quite strongly that that's quite a strong candidate. Post-war, post-war, maybe post-Western world is the next. And with that, back to you, Mitali, and I look forward to the questions. And there are so many, both that are coming in and that I have, uh, but it is... I'm not sure if it's with mixed relief that I heard the last W, Timothy, because I have begun to see conversations happening between political analysts and social scientists about whether this is some form of a W, which is a World War III, that we may be looking at, just in a very, very different shape and form. Um, Thank you for tethering us to the here and now, and I feel one thread we could pick up because we didn't address that in uh, what you outlined, but it will have important ramifications, not just for Europe, but for many other uh, nations that you alluded to, which is 
the elections in the US. Yeah. Uh, how much of an impact do you think it will have in a more localized form on what happens with Russia and Ukraine? And by extension, what do you think the ramifications of a potential Trump win could mean for the EU? Great question. Just on the world war, because several people have been talking about yeah. it. Neil Ferguson, for example. I don't I don't buy that. Um I, I don't think that the the axis Russia, China, Iran, North Korea is anything like, you know, the axis of Germany, Japan, Italy in the Second World War, for the reason I just gave a moment ago, because all these powers are very transactional. Right? So when the interest balance shifts, they will, you know, they will they will shift again. So I don't think we're there yet. Now the Trump the Trump shock, which by the way I think is probable. I think realistically we'd have to say the chances are over fifty percent if you look at the polling in the battleground states and how old Biden just looks. Um, uh, first of all, Viktor Orban came back from Mar-a-Lago and said Trump had told him that pretty much overnight he would stop the support for Ukraine. That's going to be a catastrophe for Ukraine. In that eventuality, you know, if we've done the maximum we can do in Europe this year, we could probably help you enable the Ukrainians to hold the line, right? But not much more. So it's, it's, it's a disaster for Ukraine. For Europe as a whole, it depends which Trump you, we get, right? Unlike for his first term, there are now detailed plans for his second term. As you know, the Heritage Foundation has a whole detailed plan. Now, what they say on NATO is rapidly pull back our conventional forces, American conventional forces from Europe, because we need them all for Asia Pacific and the com competition with China, but leave the nuclear umbrella in place for Europe. Right now, that that's really challenging for us, for, for NATO in Europe, but but we can manage it. If Trump goes further than that and really does what he's boasted about and says, to hell with you, you can no, lo no longer rely on our Article 5 nuclear guarantee, then it's a force nine, 10 crisis for European security. And the question of the, here's an interesting point, the only two European nuclear deterrents, the British and the French nuclear deterrent, who do they cover at that point, becomes very immediate. What about a Biden victory, Timothy? Just for a second to sort of um, to explore that. As you said, we do have some suggestions from what happened in Trump's era 1.0. It was not just NATO. He upped the pressure in terms of tariffs. It was a fictitious relationship that he had with the EU, and he chose to keep it that way. Um, it looks at this point like Biden is also struggling to provide support. It also looks, as you walked us through, that the EU itself is struggling to find its feet on what exactly the tone it is that it wants to take with regards to support to Ukraine. Um, there have been suggestions from some other surveys that many people believe Russia might actually come out the victor in this war. And that's a reality that EU leaders themselves have not fully grappled with. Um, I guess the short point of what I'm asking is, in a time as troubled as this, are we dealing with a bit of a drought in terms of strong leadership, or at least the kind of leadership that needs to resolve this? Um, I, I, I honestly think, and I was at the Munich Security Conference last month and then just now in Brussels, Europe is really waking up to how desperate the situation is. Um, the Czech president, who's a former NATO general, has found 800,000 rounds of ammunition, which is a lot of ammo, of the kind Ukraine needs on world markets. And he said to the rest of Europe, you guys have the money. If you find the money, they're finding the money. So actually, there is a real sense of urgency about it. Um, uh, 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 and in terms of European leadership, we actually have some amazing people. I mean, the Kaya Kalas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, um, Meta Fredriksson, the Danish Prime Minister, the Czech President, President Pavel. 
are, are, are actually Mark Rutte is not bad in the Netherlands. Our problem is that we don't have the great leaders in the great in the big countries, right? In France or Germany or Italy. So we we do have a problem of leadership. But honestly, if my, if Biden gets back, Europe will still have to do much more. But we will have had much more time to get there. And we can rely on the US to keep you know, pretty much its current level of support. And therefore, you can add on the European support and and have no doubt about the Article 5 guarantee. Before I switch over to the many questions that are now pouring in, um, and since you've walked in both shoes, I will not refer to the graves. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean for journalism in these times? Um, what does it mean for the kind of stories you should be looking at? Because as you said, as we speak, there is violent conflict uh, such that I don't think we've seen in, in, in many of our living years um, unfolding in Israel and Gaza. It also seems to be a situation where leaders don't have the control that they would like on that situation. How, as journalists, do we navigate what's unfolding before us, even as journalists themselves are at risk, their lives are at risk while reporting in these areas? So, of course, the heart of journalism is reporting. And we need the reporting, the front line, in all senses, reporting more than ever in a world where disinformation, misinformation, narratives are a very large part of the war itself. They're, they're in a way, as much part of the war as tanks and guns. Um, and the possibilities for manipulation, uh, as we all know, are, 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 are much larger. Um, for example, in Slovakia, a mass of very successful Russian dis and misinformation has been spread, particularly through Facebook, which plays a dominant role in, in Slovakia, um, EU member state, NATO member state. So um, more and more and better reporting um, at the Guardian, you know, the Guardian, where I have a column, I had a column for many years, the, the great editor's um, slogan was, um, comment is free, but facts are sacred. Uh, the, the new version of it is comment is free, but facts are expensive, right? So actually supporting good foreign and investigative reporting particularly in war zones or in insecure situations, is very expensive. So finding the resources to do that. Um, the other quick point to make is we have the problem with Ukraine that we have with Bosnia. After two years, the journalists on the spot have done every story five times. The school story, the hospital story, the wonderful concepts underground story, the frontline story, the leadership story, you name it. And so it's slipping down the news agenda and slipping off the front page, right? Um, because there is that, there's also that, as it were, journalistic fatigue, if you like, not on the part maybe of the reporters themselves, but on the part of the desks of the editors. And combating that, finding ways to make a, an old and familiar, you know, long war story still compelling, still grabbing, still motivating, is I think a, a great challenge for for you know both, well for all kinds of journalism. Let's dive straight into the questions. Um, I'm going to save this space for online questions because uh, we're lucky enough to have you in person. So you will be speaking with our journalist fellows in a little bit. The first one is quite clear and simple. Do you think Putin would use nuclear weapons over Ukraine? Yes, it's always a possibility. This is a guy whose own future depends on this war uh, and he's ruthless and he, he he kills his opponents so why not well it's unlikely um there's actually been some serious reporting done particularly in the financial times that he and his closest advisors game planned this early in the conflict we'd only be talking about tactical nuclear weapons obviously in ukraine and concluded that the military advantage would be minimal and the political fallout would be enormous. But secondly, it's pretty clear that China in particular has told him that they don't want that taboo uh, 
post-45 taboo on the use of nuclear weapons to be broken. So it's possible, but I think it's unlikely. The next one, because there has been a lot of um, narrative as well around NATO, is how would you score the recent expansion, I imagine, of NATO on the hubris scale as it is considered a red line by the Kremlin? Um, absolutely not on the hubris scale. Um, on the contrary, I think it's a very, very good thing we did it, because imagine if you were Estonia today and you weren't in NATO, how secure you would be feeling. And when you say a red line by the Kremlin, Giuseppe, I see, yes, it, when you say red line for the Kremlin, actually you have to read the book because there's a, a long, a, 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 several pages going into depth in what actually happened. And what actually happened was that while... Russia obviously wasn't happy about the Eastward enlargement of NATO. Uh, it was informed about it, and it didn't formally object to it. And actually, there was something called the NATO-Russian Council created in 2002 with Vladimir Putin uh, in order to establish, to keep a security relationship with Russia at the same time as the Eastward enlargement of NATO was happening. And George Robertson, the former Secretary General of NATO, told me that in numerous, I think it was 16 meetings with Putin, Putin never once raised an objection to the eastward enlargement of NATO. So this is this is a canard, it's a myth. It wasn't the eastward enlargement of NATO that was the cause of the invasion of Ukraine. The cause of the invasion of Ukraine was Putin's desire to make Russia great again, and his fear of democracy in Ukraine. The next question, and it harks back to some of the countries that you mentioned, is from Ilgin Yurulmaz, and he says, what about a country like modern-day Turkey? Where does that fall into the new European narrative where there's a nationalist view of catering to your own ambitions, reconnecting with the Ottoman Empire, and then you have the Turkey that we have today? Yeah, a, a friend of mine who was a, back in the day a European foreign minister once joked that after after a meeting with Recep Tayyip Erdogan, um, he, he said, we thought that Turkey wanted to join the EU, but it turns out that they want us to join the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> no, it plays as with Putin. That, uh, like that problem in India, it sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, empires, you know, tell me your empire and I'll tell you who you are. They play an enormous role in contemporary political imagination. Also, Austro-Hungarian empire, by the way. Um, so, so that is clearly the case. I mean, Erdogan is a classic example of what I was talking about behaving like an imperial great power, trying to make your uh, connection through the Middle East and actually succeeding very well in having good relations with Russia and with the West, even when those two are at war. Um, you asked about Azerbaijan. I mean, I think Azerbaijan clearly is getting very unhappy of being regarded as part of the post-Soviet space. One nation, I think, would be an overstatement, but I'm sure we will see realignments uh, in which Turkey will be a really important uh, a regional player, as it already is in the Middle East. Here's an interesting one, and perhaps points to a larger issue, um, an anonymous attendee. During the Medvedev speech that you mentioned, it wasn't just Eastern Ukraine shown subsumed by Russia, but parts of Western Ukraine were sliced off to Poland and Hungary. Do you sense that there are willing collaborators in this um, idea of European countries reclaiming parts of Ukrainian territories. Um, and I guess the broader question here is, is there a necessary rethink required on the East-West divide that exists now in conversations around the EU? Yeah. Short answer, no. I don't think even Viktor Orban is dreaming of getting back to Ushkorod and the little bit at the very far western end of of Ukraine, which has a significant Hungarian minority and used once to belong to Hungary? I think not, and Poland certainly not. Um, by the way, Medvedev actually went further than Putin, because Putin, in his amateur historical essay on the unity of Ukraine and Russia, actually cons said that he thinks Western Ukraine, the part that around Lviv, and the part that used to belong to the Austro-Hungarian Empire or to the Polish Commonwealth, um, 
that's fine. That's not us. That's something different. Um, so even he doesn't, uh, uh, although his initial plan was, well, his initial plan was actually to have the whole of Ukraine as a puppet state. Um, uh, East-West divide, honestly, Mitali, I think this can be overstated. It's just so much more complicated now. There are huge differences between East European countries. I mean, you know, the Czech Republic is has much, many more similarities in its politics to Austria than it does to Serbia, for example. And then there's a big north-south divide. And honestly, Marine Le Pen, I think, will be quite at home in the Polish Populist Party. And Herb Wilders in Hungarian. So I think that there are all sorts of dividing lines opening up, and it's not just simply east-west. I want to move to some of the questions below because it's sort of broadening the range of the discussion. And there's one, uh, Timothy, about the findings that you presented um, in the last part of your talk, plus the perception on the Israel military campaign in Gaza. How do you think those two elements are affecting Western policymakers at this point? particularly with what's happening in Israel. Um, why is it that neither the U EU nor the US heads of state are ready to condition their support for Israel? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very legitimate question. You know the answer from history for the US, so let me take the European question, because whereas the EU is until now, until recently, shown great unity on Ukraine. From day one, it was all over the place on Israel, Hamas. I mean, they're just very, very different positions being taken by European governments. And one of the problems is Germany, because Germany, having been the author of the Holocaust, has this position which could be crudely and unkindly summarized as Israel, our country, right or wrong, an unconditional solidarity with Israel. And of course, Germany is a central power, the most important single power in the European Union. Um, so that, that does a lot to help explain the, the disunity, although there are also others who are in very different places. I think Germany is drawing the wrong conclusion from the Nazi past. Because I think the right conclusion from the Nazi past is that Germany, above all, should stand for human rights, for international humanitarian law, for the respect for civilian populations, for opposing anything that could potentially begin even to look like genocide wherever it happens. So I regret very much this, this lack of European unity. Well, of course, one also has to say that the attacks on the 7th of October were absolutely brutal, terrible, horrendous, that they're still hanging on to the hostages. And so, and Hamas is also, you know, the people of Gaza are paying the price also for what Hamas has done. But nonetheless, I think I wish we had a much clearer position, which was insisting on compliance with the laws of war and international humanitarian law, wherever they're violated and by whomever they're violated. And just by extension, I think the next question fits in very interestingly, which is around the present and the future of the security system of the United Nations. And one might argue the role of an organization like the UN in present times. Yeah, so this goes, goes back to the a la carte world, doesn't it? Because, as I was suggesting at the beginning, the UN is basically a picture of the world frozen in 1945 with the permanent five. And so either we have major reform of our international institutions, such as the UN, to make them fit for purpose in 2024, or life will increasingly be elsewhere. Now, obviously, normatively, the former should happen. That's what should happen. Uh, if you ask me what I think is likely to happen, I think it's likely to be more of the latter, and it will increasingly be an a la carte world um, 
in which you will have shifting great power alliances. But by the way, I also don't think, you know, I mentioned the axis not being the axis. Many people are now thinking that BRICS or BRICS plus six is going to be a new grouping to, you know, counter the West. I don't think that's credible. These countries have such different interests. Let's take India and China uh, and, 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 and significant differences between them. So I think the danger is more of international anarchy than of a new bipolar international order. I think the number of bilateral ties versus multilateral ties that have been inked in the last few years is enough evidence of that. We have just enough time for one question, and I'm going to take moderator rights and make it my own before we speak with our journalists, which is um, you mentioned the axis and you mentioned the empires. Uh, the one we haven't touched upon, which might start to grow, um, is religion. Because only a few weeks back, the Pope decided that uh, there was something he would have to say about the Russia-Ukraine conflict itself. And he pointed towards the white flag as a sign of strength, something um, that Ukraine reacted to very strongly. Do you fear that within this very, very messy situation, we might have religion wading in as well? Well, I think it's a disastrous intervention really disastrous because, you know, what popes have traditionally done, and interestingly enough, John Paul II, the Polish pope, who you might think of as a great cold warrior, made himself very unpopular in all sorts of places because he called for peace wherever there was war, right? The Falklands War, he called for peace everywhere consistently. And that's 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 the job of the pope, right? That, but that was what the man said 2,000 years ago. Um, but this went way beyond that. Um, I would say a couple of things. N number one, I don't think, I think we are getting more kind of civilizational rather than ideological identities in the great powers, right? So Putin talks about the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. I don't need to tell you, Modi thinks about it in terms of, of Hinduism. Uh, China talks about itself as a civilizational state. So I think it's more these kind of civilizational discourses rather than religion as such or the religious uh, leaders. Um, the other thing to say about, about Europe and is that, you know, if I think back on these 50 years, Europe was still fairly homogenous, ethnically, religiously, culturally, 50 years ago. Now, Europe has people from everywhere, right? It's, it's become de facto multicultural, multi-religious. And so if you start getting conflicts anywhere, they are a domestic problem for Europe, right? Israel-Hamas is a domestic issue for Europe. And then if you start getting politicians, as is happening to us in Britain now, who start trying to play those politics with one religious against another, in this case notably uh, against Islam, that becomes a major problem for our own societies. So to say it very simply, it's a bit of a cliche, but for Europe it's certainly true. Um, the, the, the dividing line between domestic and foreign policy has almost entirely broken down. Because if you have people from everywhere, then what happens anywhere also happens at home. Timothy, as a student of political science and a student of journalism, it's been an absolute uh, delight to hear you speak. Thank you very much for being so gracious with your time for our online audience. And um, can't wait for you to interact with our journalist fellows who are waiting downstairs. But for everyone who joined in online, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did, and we will see you very soon. Great pleasure.